so today we're going to talk about how to make a software file on ARM64. First, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Signat. Uh, I work for Cloudflare. I do performance and security. Uh, I'm kind of passionate about cryptography, and I also enjoy low-level programming, so like Linux kernel bootloaders and other very low-level and scary stuff. So first, first of all, why? Why do we want to consider uh, another CPU architecture in your cloud, right? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them, the first one is probably the most important one, is vendor lock-in. So people talk a lot about like how to unlock yourself from AWS, how to do like cloud agnostic infrastructure, but no one talks about really how to avoid Intel CPUs, right? Because everyone runs on Intel. Who here doesn't run code on Intel? You run on AMD, right? Okay, good. Uh, the second potential region is e energy savings. So like we heard that some CPU architectures can be more power efficient. And for example, uh, this is uh, Cloud for Network today. I th don't think you see the, do you see the map, world map? So we run around like 200 data centers across the world now. And imagine if we can be at least a little bit more power efficient, we can probably save enough power to power a like, small African city or some something like that, right? With power efficiency, you can also cut money. Like you have to pay for power. If you use less power, you have to pay less. As well as if you're you can run on a different CPU architecture, maybe your choice of hardware is uh, more wide and then you can select uh, more cost-effective solutions for your server. There is also this. Uh, who doesn't know what this is? You know or you don't know? Ah, <laughs> yeah, so this is Meltdown Inspector, right? So initially we were just like considering Oh, should we do ARM or should we not? But like when these attacks came out, it was like, where well, we definitely should seriously consider another CPU architecture. And like to be honest, ARM64 is somewhat vulnerable to Spectre as well. But we we were thinking like, what if what if there'll be another hardware attack which cannot be patched uh, by software anymore, and it will be so severe that we have to shut down all our s Intel CPUs. If we have like at least 50% on ARM, we can still stay in business, right? So this is like why a different CPU architecture in general, why ARM64 specifically. So basically it performs well in the mobile and IoT space with all the smartphones uh, you running, modern smartphones uh, run on ARM64. They're potentially more power efficient because ARM CPU architecture was originally designed for small power efficient devices. Uh, nowadays it has huge developer community, again thanks to the boom of the mobile market. What's important for us, it nowadays it has first class support in Linux. In Cloudflare we are primarily a Debian shop and like Debian from version 8, Jesse, uh, has ARM64 as a primary architecture, therefore it receives the same amount of attention and support as the x86 one. ARM has established tool nowadays. A uh, long time ago, when you're considering some other non x86 architecture, you had to go to some dodgy websites to download compilers or something else. Now you can just get it from your Linux package manager. They're all available and official and working really well. Why ARM64 specifically? Because it's more than 32. <laughs> uh, where in mobile and IoT space, you can still get away with four gig of RAM uh, on your device. Like in the server scenario, your server will probably be useless if you have only four gigabyte of RAM, right? And it, it kind of mitigates the risk, right? So like we didn't want to consider like IMD, which is like slightly different from Intel, but the same architecture. We wanted something completely different and uh, to mitigate potential hardware vulnerabilities. And ARM architecture is completely different from Intel 1, right? So yeah, we did some initial benchmarks. 
And so we like had a synthetic benchmark which kind of uh, represent our production workflow. And we had a test CPU uh, from Qualcomm, test server CPU called Falcor Core. Uh, so we decided to test its performance. And so this is our uh, current generation Skylake Intel CPU. Uh, this is our previous generation uh, Broadwell CPU, and this is Falcor. And this is kind of Nginx based a benchmark with our custom logic in Lua on top. And you can see here, uh, so Falcor actually came second, so it, uh, it won, it, it is better than our previous generation Intel CPU. Uh, so our current, it's only 1,000 requests per second behind our current generation Intel CPU. But during this benchmark, we also measured the consumed power, and to serve 15,000 requests, uh, ARM consumed like half the power compared to the our current Intel generation, which is kind of good. So we we think it's a good to trade off 1,000 requests per second for like 50% of power savings. So we were very satisfied with this benchmark, and uh, the next thing, like, okay, let's put it into production, and when we put the server into our data center, so <laughs> it looked like something like that, uh, because it doesn't work. It doesn't have any software in it, right? So, so from this point now on, we went to our developers and we say, hey developers, from now on, please compile and all your software, all the projects you're managing uh, to ARM64 as well. And here where the problems came up. So the first class of problems we encountered when we tried to port ar ARM64 is basically compile time problems. When you talk, when you talk to your developers, uh, what their their concer initial concern will be probably, oh, we it will be very hard because we uh, to port software because there, there is a lot of assembly in it and like architecture specific stuff. It's actually not true. During our long and rather painful port porting process we never encountered this specific case. It was always something else. The real problem now with your developers when you're adopting a second CPU architecture is that now the production architecture is not the same as the developer architecture. So you have ARM64 servers, but developers still have x86 laptops, right? And, and the typical solution to that is like how do they produce software for ARM64 and the typical solution to that is cross-compilation. Anyone here doesn't know what a cross-compilation is? Whoever used cross-compile? Oh, nice. I'll briefly explain the process. So in a typical of native compiler, imagine you have a source file, you have your developer laptop, which is x86, it runs a compiler, you feed your source file to the compiler, it produces a binary, and you basically install that binary into your production machine. You can also run it locally to run tests. Cross-compiler is a little bit different, so again, you have your source file, you have your developer laptop, it's still x x86, but it runs a different kind of compiler called cross-compiler, which produces a binary for a different CPU architecture and you install it to your production ARM64 environment, and you can't run it locally because your x86 laptop does not know how to run it. And to explain all the problems we encountered with cross-compilation, uh, you need to uh, grasp some basic cross-compiler terminology. So in cross-compiler world, the host is the architecture where the compiler runs. It's usually the developer laptop, x86, and the target. The target architecture is for which the compiler generates machine code. So this is your production architecture, in our case it's ARM64. And there is like a particular case where host equals target, they call it native compilation or just compilation which we're used to, which is actually a small subset of a more general cross compilation. Uh, here is it like a small example, consider it as a demo, I promise I copy pasted it from a real terminal. So <laughs> So if you have a source file, you want to compile it, you just invoke your compiler, it produces a binary, you can inspect the binary, you can see that it's for x86 architecture and you can test it, right? You can run it. 
if you want to port this code to ARM, you just replace your compiler with a cross compiler. It produces a binary, and now you can see that this is a binary for ARM64 uh, architecture. And you cannot run it locally because, again, your developer laptop does not know how to run ARM64 code. So most of the compiler pro compile time problems come from trying to use cross compilation on the projects which do not support them. And the first symptom we encountered is both broken native and cross builds. We actually like to explain our thought process. We actually wanted to move fast. So we wanted to try to cross compile our software. And if it doesn't work, we had a dedicated ARM64 box for developers, so they just can copy the project there and try native compilation, but ARM to ARM, to see if it's the problem of the code or it's the problem of the build system. So in this case, uh, both native and cross builds were blocking, so we cannot comp cross compile the project, and even we could not natively compile it on an ARM64 machine. And you usually good uh, get an error from your build system, looks something like this. And the cause of this is probably your build system has hard-coded architecture-specific flags. So uh, we're mostly using makefiles. If you use makefile build system, you will kind of find some line like this or this in your, in your makefile. So MSEE2 is an um, instruction extension for x86 platform. Uh, but when you feed it to the ARM64 compiler, uh, the GCC doesn't know how to interpret it, so it errors out. So the advice here for developers, if you're starting a new project and you want to make your build system cross-compiler friendly from scratch, just put architecture-specific flag in a separate variable one for each architecture. For example, you have some kind of variable in your makefile which defines the target architecture you're building for, and you have compiler-specific flags for x86, you have compiler-specific flags for ARM64, and then the your final compiler flags, just you use this pattern and it kind of works. The second symptom we encountered, just broken cross-compilation. So the project compiles natively fine on ARM to ARM, but the cross compilation I is broken, so developers are not very happy about it because they cannot test the build on their local systems. And this usually happens when the compiler outputs need some additional post-processing, like a format conversion. Uh, so the output from the compiler needs to be post-processed. And the repository is set up in the way that post-processing tool source is part of the project. And you get similar error, like unrecognized common line option. So to explain what I mean by project setup, so here is a, a schema or flow of the build I'm referring to. So imagine you have some source files. Uh, you have your target compiler, which is usually cross-compiler. In If you're doing cross-compilation, you get some intermediate result, like intermediate output from the compiler. Then you have like additional uh, tools and they're provided in the source form in your the repository. And then you need to compile those tools for your host architecture because you need those tools during the build process. And you get the uh, binaries for those tools, and then you feed the intermediate artifacts to these tools, and then you get the final output. This is a very typical uh, build system setup if you're building a bootloader because for example, your BIOS doesn't know, so compiler GCC produces an ELF executable and the BIOS does not know how to run ELF executable, so you need to process this post-process this output and convert format to the one the BIOS will understand or do some custom linking or, or, or whatever. And so in this case, you basically ha have two compilers. You have the cross compiler and you have like the native compilation for the adi additional tools. And the cross compiler itself fails because uh, both of them use generic C flags, uh, like compiler flags, and not split, uh, don't split the compiler flags for target architecture and host architecture. So we encountered this issue is basically in IPXC project, uh, which is a very popular bootloader. We use it in production. And uh, basically, they desi design their build system to actually support cross-compilation, but it fails. So probably they never tested it. 
so they have these workaround flags and they are defined based on the target architecture, but then they use uh, the same flags for building these host tools and they that part of the build process fails. So again, advice for developers, put architecture specific flags in a separate variable as before. And so you don't get them mixed up when you define variables in your build system, always prefix any compiler or linker options with target or host. So you clearly know which compiler flags go to which compiler, like target compiler or the host compiler. Uh, here, DevOps can help as well. So if you're designing a build system which is cross-compiler friendly, why not test it in your CI, right? <laughs> so apparently for this IPXE project, they had all support for cross-compilation cross in the build system, but because it was probably never tested, it was broken. Uh, and you can also lint project build systems for these advices I'm giving you now, like from non-prefix variable definitions. When I proposed it at work, many people complained that like, oh, why do we need to test cross-compilation if we don't use it yet? It will be a, a longer build process, but I consider it a feature slightly longer build process is kind of giving your developers a chance to relax more. They are very stressed. So the final symptom from compile time problem we encountered, you get broken artifacts. So basically cross compilation succeeds, native compilation also works, but the final artifacts are not usable. And again, it usually happens when the compiler output needs additional post-processing, like in the case before. But the difference is these post-processing tools are also released as part of the project. So they, they both, these tools are needed both during the uh, build process and they are also released as an artifact. Yeah, so these tools are released as an artifact. And we get error something like that, exact format error, which basically means when we try to run this artifact on the target system, which basically means it was compiled for wrong architecture. The cost for this is we just mixed up target compiler flags and host compiler flags or some kind of incorrect build dependency declaration. And we encountered this problem is actually a very unpopular project called Linux kernel. So uh, <laughs> when you use the native, when you use the cross, com cross compile your Linux kernel to a different architecture, you get broken Linux header Debian package. If you don't know, Linux headers Debian package is needed to compile third-party drivers later for your kernel you're compiling to. Uh, so, and the workflow looks kind of similar as in the case before, but there is additional step where these additional tools are released uh, a, as another artifact. So basically what happened here is uh, this fixed dep tool is needed uh, to post-process kernel modules. So you, you compile your kernel modules here, then you need to post-process them, so you compile this fixed dep tool here and to produce your final artifact, your final kernel modules. But also you need to package this tool into this package so people later can compile third-party kernel modules for your, for your kernel. So and, and here, during your build system, you need this tool for x86 architecture, but you need to package the ARM64 one for later usage. And like Linux build system somehow was screwed up and didn't do that. And it packaged x86 version for ARM64 package. So the advice here is ensure that your all target artifacts are pro processed with target compiler, not host compiler. Uh, and what I like about some projects which are like cross-compiler friendly, for example, if you try to build Android from source, you get all the project output for host and target in a different directory. So you can clearly see which target artifacts has not have not been compiled for the target architecture. And for DevOps, again, uh, always test your cross-compilation in the CI and also, what you can do is you can probably inspect the final artifacts for anomalies. For example, you had a test in our build script, which uh, you can inspect dev packages, and you see a dev package for ARM64 architecture containing an x86 binary. That's probably something went wrong, and you can catch it in build time. Okay, so we compiled everything. <laughs> and
and launch it into production. And now we encountered runtime problems. So the first symptom we encountered is the process was complaining about not being able to allocate memory. However, when you log into the system and check the free memory, there is pretty fr plenty of free memory in the system. Uh, you will likely encounter this if the process is using a map system call for file I.O., uh, like most databases do like that. And in our case, it was a key value store, so kind of a database. And the error looks like this, like enomem, it just says cannot allocate memory. To understand what happened here, let's go back to 32-bit versus 64-bit. So 32-bit allows us to address up to 4 gigabytes of RAM, right? Who doesn't agree? <laughs> With Hyman. 64-bit uh, allows you to address up to uh, I can't pronounce that, but like, let's call it more than enough, right? Well, actually, the cake is a lie. And it's not about only Linux. Every operating system tricks you. But the example from Linux is you don't get all the address space from, from your bitness of your architecture. So for example, the way how Linux sets up its memory, you only get your you as a user space application you only get uh, like lower 47 bits of addresses then there is a huge hole which is unused and like these higher bit addresses is reserved for kernel itself the operating system kernel uh, so actually in user space you on 64 bit system you can only have 47 bit of addressable user space and that cuts cuts down your addressable space to 1,000, yeah, 128 terabytes compared to promised this, right? Uh, but still more than enough. However, on ARM64, if you, you have a different memory layout, and you actually ha can have different types of memory layout, but if you take the default one, which we, w we didn't have experience with ARM, we'd say, like, we will take the default one, which is safe from kernel. Perspective. It gives you only 39 bit of addresses, and that gives you up to only 512 gigabyte of addressable space. So let's go back to the database case. That imagine if your database is large enough, it's more than 500 gigs, which is quite common these days, right? We have a lot of data. You just can't map this file because you don't have enough of addressable space. And the error you will receive it will be exactly cannot allocate memory, although it doesn't try to allocate memory. It just cannot, does not have enough addressable space to uh, map the file. So the, avoid, uh, the problem was, this is where our like internal code. So the advice here is try to avoid unbounded memory mappings. It's kind of hard, I mean, it's very hard to debug because you just get this cryptic message, right? Uh, but uh, if you're a good developer, try to encode the fact, try to check what is the upper bound of a user space, addressable space. I, 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 I'm not aware if there is any portable way to do that, but on Linux, you can do that actually, so you, your software can check what is the upper addressable space of software, and if you're trying to map a file bigger than that, you can at least provide a meaningful error message that, well, it doesn't work because this and that. For DevOps, um, make sure you review your second CPU architecture memory layout. And you might need to recompile the kernel for that, which we did actually. So we chose, we chose a different uh, memory layout for ARM64, which gives us 48 bits of user space addresses, which is 256 terabyte of addressable space, which should be fine, right? So it's even more than x86 now. What could go wrong here? And some other workloads started to crash randomly. <laughs> so we traced it down to lower code. In Cloudflare, where we are very heavy users of Lua, uh, and we are, uh, yeah, and like for performance reasons, we use Lua JIT, to JIT our Lua code. So introducing you Lua JIT 
light user data module. It's a simple and efficient C interface. Uh, it is efficient because it operates directly on C pointers and stores these pointers in Lua variables. But the, Lua the, the module developers somehow noticed that, as we described before, 64-bit platforms have only 47-bit of user space addresses. So when they stored C pointers, they said, hey, we have these like upper bits, which are supposedly always zero, so why don't we use that to store our metadata as well? Yeah, so if you go here, uh, you'll see this like comment. It, it was very hard to find that on 64-bit platforms, you have 47-bit pointers. But they, they, they should have written the x86 64-bit platforms, not every 64. Like ARM can have a different type of pointers, right? And in our case, we had 48. In our case, we had 48-bit pointers, so sometimes this higher bit was corrupted, and sometimes the workload crashed. The advice here, uh, please, developers, state your assumptions in code, not in comments. So if you assume your target platform has 47-bit address pointers, check it when you start your process, and uh, give a an meaningful error message, like, I cannot run because this assumption does not hold, right? Don't over-optimize, so like storing metadata in C pointers is uh, maybe is a very extreme optimization case here. And if you do want to optimize, maybe you can provide a fallback less optimal generic implementation if your assumption does not hold and if you check it. Same goes for DevOps here, actually. There is no big difference here. Next type of my favorite optimization is page size. So like if you if somebody optimizes something, it's somewhere around page size. Who doesn't know what a page size is on a computer? Just in case. So page size is a minimum discrete block of volatile memory of your RAM. Uh, so like your C CPU doesn't operate on individual bytes, it operates on memory pages, right? And many database like workloads track to keep try to keep track of allocated pages. So they give uh, they want like sequential memory access. They because like sequential memory access is usually faster. They also want to avoid memory fragmentation. They don't want to rely on the default operating system memory management. Uh, so they don't want to blow out memory. They want to keep their data in one place and also do efficient memory reuse. So. The symptom we encountered is actually uh, the process uses much more memory on secondary CPU architecture. Um, well, and but otherwise it worked. It didn't crash. It like everything worked fine. But it it may depend case on case depending on how aggressive the code with memory management. And the code the cause for this the process had hard coded page size in code. So for x86 platform. The page size is, is always four kilobytes. There is no, al almost never a different page size. But on ARM64, depending on your memory layout, you can have four kilobyte pages, 16 kilobyte pages, and 64 kilobyte pages. Uh, so wha what you may end up here if you just hard code your 4K page size. So this, how the code roughly looks right on x86 system, when you just transfer this code to ARM64 with 16K page size, you get this picture, right? So you kind of lost everything you've been fighting for. You lost sequential memory access, you lost efficient memory reuse, you're overusing memory, and you have memory fragmentation, so your data is scattered across the RAM. Developers, don't do this. 14,000 exact matches on GitHub as of this, uh, maybe more even, grows. Instead, you can just ask your operating system what is the current page size and runtime and, and optimize around that. For DevOps, you should definitely monitor your process memory usage on a different architecture when you port your code. Next thing is file system block size. 
it's like page size, but for files. So this is the minimum amount of any piece of data I can occupy on disk, right? So even if you write one byte, it will still occupy at least block bytes. Uh, it's usually a multiple of underlying block device block size, and typical values for file system are 500 bytes or 4 kilobytes, depending on your underlying storage device. I think for Windows it's called like the cluster size or something like that, if you're from Windows world. And most of the time you don't have to uh, care about the file system block size except for sparse files. Anyone here doesn't know what a sparse file is? Oh, good. A sparse file is a file. It's a large file, but which is mostly empty. It has a lot of zeros in it, like continuous zeros. And so, in most cases, the physical block size, uh, the physical file size, is always larger than the logical block size because one byte occupies at least block bytes, right? Except for sparse files. For modern file system, are smart enough to recognize that the file is like contains a lot of zeros, and they d don't store zeros on the actual zeros on this. They just store a marker saying, okay, this range is zeros. So in this case, the physical file size is actually smaller than the logical file size. The symptom we encountered is we had a, uh, we used a project called Captain Proto, and it had a test suite, and the sparse file test was failing on ARM64. And the interesting thing about this, the test failed only when we run the test suite from uh, TMPFS, which is a RAM-based file system. So on ARM64, it only fails on TMPFS, but if you copy the project to a normal AXT4 or XFS file system, it works. The cause was the process had car-coded block size and code. And on memory-backed file system, which TMPFS, the file system block size is equal to the page size. And we already established that ARM64 may have 4K pages, 16K pages, or 64K pages. So when you copy on XT4 file system, it has a 4K block size, so the test succeeded. But when you copy it to the RAM-based file system, it had like 16K block size, and the test failed. Developers don't do this, you can ask your file system, what is your block size? And then structure code around that. This is basically it. So you may notice I never mentioned any assembly here. And most of the examples I've given here are written not in C, are written in Go, Python, Lua, any other like supposedly cross-platform language. So we can say here that even portable code with many, with no assembly can fail in many ways on different CPU architecture. Advice for developers, don't over-optimize, always provoke a fallback implementation. Uh, try to not rely on assumptions in your code, and if you want to rely on them, test them in code and provide meaningful error output to the operators. Uh, yeah, and pro for DevOps, uh, in set up a CI to test different diverse architectures and configuration, especially cross compiler and also you can design tools and linters to enforce best practices, which hopefully I advise here uh, in your code and build scripts. This is how our ARM64 servers look in production now. They're almost indistinguishable from x86. Versions sometimes when an SRE goes in, logs in to do some debugging, uh, they don't even know they'll be doing like management of an ARM64 server. That's it. Thank you.